All right, hey guys, we're talking about the rise of Prussia. Um, it's going to be a little bit longer, but we're going to get through this. Uh, a little bit of background um, about the Holy Roman Empire. Remember, it was created in the Middle Ages throughout the Reformation. It had a lot of turmoil, um, basically it fell apart uh, more and more, never really held uh, to be a true empire. And finally, after the Thirty Years' War, we're seeing that it's uh, split between the Catholics and the Protestants down the middle. And um, after 1648, we're seeing that all of the German states are now autonomous and individually sovereign. And you have basically 300 Germanies. And the princes were stronger than the emperor. Okay, so the same pattern is still fulfilling itself. Um, the population <clears throat> after uh, the Thirty Years' War will drop. Okay. It'll drop um, a third, but then it'll come back up by 1700. So um, after the war, the Holy Roman Empire um, was an empire with no army, with no revenues, and a government that is falling apart with no administration. Um, Voltaire said that the Holy Roman Empire was neither holy, Roman, nor an empire um, because it really um, was not Roman in the sense where it didn't have any practice of imperialism. It was not holy anymore because it had no uh, religious unity and it was only an empire in principle. Okay, so we mentioned them a little bit, but um, uh, the Prussians are going to be ruled by the Hohenzollerns. And um, we're talking about starting from Frederick the I, uh, Frederick um, the first all the way down up until uh, World War One. okay? So this is a map of the growth of Prussia from 1417, the year that they uh, gain the power to become an elector, one of the seven, and we'll talk about that. Um, you can, I'll just keep it here for a little bit so you can kind of see the major events through each one. You can pause it to take a look at it, and then we'll continue. All right, so um, Brandenburg, Prussia. Brandenburg was a small state, um, and its center was Berlin. Uh, the ruler of Brandenburg was one of the uh, seven princes to elect the emperor. They were able to achieve this in 1415, and another important city in Brandenburg is Potsdam. Um, predominantly that they are Lutheran uh, after the Peace of Westphalia and the Hohenzollerns um, inherited different lands. Okay, so Brandenburg that they rule will um, gain the Duchy of East Prussia and Pomerania which are along the Baltic and um, here you have these cute little Pomeranians yeah, I don't really like small dogs. Um, but uh, yes, these Pomeranians are from natively Pomerania. Um, they will get smaller and smaller. It's little toy Pomeranians that girls love um, as they are bred with smaller breeds. Um, hmm. Okay, so with acquiring all these lands, they are actually separated. They are not connected, and so they don't really have natural boundaries. Their resources are not very vast, and uh, their population is only at 1.5 million. And uh, the Hohenzollerns uh, dreamed of connecting all of their possessions together, um, and they will be successful in 1772, where Brandenburg Prussia will... Um, expand more, um, especially after with the uh, partition of Poland. And so the Hohenzollern's possessions will eventually um, become the second largest block of territory in the Holy Roman Empire, the Habsburgs being the first. And uh, you have in 1718, they're able to dominate the South Baltic Sea territories. All right, so one thing is that you have your Frederick. Williams and Williams and Fredericks and back and forth and numbers and, and kings and um, do your best to follow along. 
each one has kind of like additional things that they're adding on to and really developing Prussia, okay? Um, Frederick William is known as the Great Elector. Um, he was the first to make um, Prussia modern and he would basically uh, forge territories into um, a strong power. Uh, he realized that Prussia had a lot of vulnerable lands, open lands, and this meant that he, in order to defend it, you must have a strong military. So he began to equip uh, his troops, and he wanted to protect his lands, and um, to the point where if he had a strong military, he would be able to be a player in the balance of power in Europe. And that um, even though he never held a crown, um, he was never king, but he was still the position of great elector. And so um, with this, he's able to lay the foundation for absolutism because um, he will work with the nobility. Okay. Also, having a uh, standing army um, also helps because uh, he can use his army if need be, but he will only use it if necessary. His focus is going to be on diplomacy not trying to start wars, okay? Um, so, his relationship with the Junkers, not the Junkers, but the Junkers, uh, was that, much like Peter the Great, uh, you would demand uh, loyalty from them. Um, they will only do so if you give them something in return. And so what Frederick William will provide, hey, they will give, he will give uh, the Yunkers full power over the serfs, and so all those peasants are now um, under the control of uh, the Yunkers. And the sons of Yunkers would also um, dominate in the army officer corps. And we'll talk about how the Yunkers are going to play into um, uh, the, the military. The Yunkers are also they're the landowners, just to, just to be clear on that. They are German landowners, okay? Um, as far as taxes go, uh, the tax collectors were also the nobles, and so that means that they're not going to really collect taxes from each other. The taxes are really going to burden uh, the peasants and also the middle and lower classes in urban areas. Um, from this, we're going to see that he, as he lays a foundation for absolutism, government officials, army, army officers are all going to take an, an oath to uh, show their allegiance and loyalty to the elector. And so now we're seeing this unification, um, this centralization of power, and from that, Prussia is going to become stronger. All right, so his um, son after him is Frederick I, okay? Um, he becomes the first king in Prussia. So it sounds weird, but that's what uh, he was given that title. King in Prussia, not king of Prussia. How was he able to gain this title? Well, um, he, with his, you know, dad's, building up his dad's success of, of an army, he had 8,000 troops, um, and he was called upon by the Habsburgs to fight in the war of the Spanish Secession. And so by, by providing 8,000 troops, uh, he received this title of king in Prussia. And so now we have a German king that is above all other German princes. And so he will pass on this royal title, king in Prussia, to his son, back to Frederick William. But this is Frederick William I, not the great elector. Okay, so Frederick William I comes in. And um, he is called the Soldier King. He will be king uh, starting in 1713. And uh, Frederick William I was determined to build a powerful army. He devoted every penny to military and did not care for luxurious living. And um, later on, we'll talk about economics, and he'll introduce some new taxes. Um, as far as the military size, it would double to over 80,000 troops. Um, in just Berlin alone, with a population of 100,000 people, okay, you have 20,000 of them soldiers, okay, 20,000 uh, soldiers. So that means 20% of your population in that city are ready to, to die for your country. Um, this would make Prussia to have the fourth largest army, and uh, the only other countries uh, greater than him are France, Russia, and Austria. And... Um, 
because his focus on military was so great, uh, these priorities basically dominated all of Prussian life. Policies were always oriented towards the military needs and focus, and um, he was the first Prussian king to always appear in a military uniform. And so these military needs uh, will bring new industries. Um, the demand from civilians was very low because they were poor. Um, the population is very poor, but soldiers need food, soldiers need uniforms, and soldiers need weapons. And so what does that mean? Well, you're going to create new industries to manufacture these things um, and to generate um, these things for the soldiers. His love of army was based upon a competitive and practical view of international politics. And he says that power is only attained through force or by threat of force. Um, so he sees the, the usefulness and utility of uh, having a powerful army. And so he would start to institute new discipline um, and, tech, and military tactics and techniques. Um, he would basically have uh, different regiments assigned to certain districts and then each district then has a source of soldiers to use um, for protection or for anything to for controlling uh, the population. The Yunkers, uh, we talked about how they were uh, given complete control and um, over the, the serfs. Um, they are actually going to be serving in the military as officers. The sons of the Yunkers are going to be part of what we call the Cadet Corps. And basically, um, the Yunkers are Prussia's most prestigious class. Um, they are, you know, the, the those that are carrying out um, the virtues and values of the Prussian army. Um, some of the, these virtues are duty, discipline, and obedience. Okay, so it's very much like um, Sparta, we talked to, uh, I, don't know, I think we talked about Sparta back in August. Um, Sparta as a military state, right, is all about obedience, being disciplined, um, just following authority and, you know, serving the state, serving uh, the king. Um, the Potsdam Giants are these tall soldiers that Frederick William the first um, started to collect and he really just thought that these tall soldiers were strong and um, more powerful and faster and just built for war and so um, he had a requirement um, that they had to be 6'2 and above and um, this is actually a lot you know like drastically bigger on average than you know what a typical uh, European man would be during this time and other monarchs such as Peter the Great would also send him uh, large soldiers because he would basically collect all of them um, alright so um, Prussia was known not that a state that possesses an army but the army that possesses a state it was um, that important that the whole country was built around the military and uh, the government really planned the country around the army uh, ironically, um, Prussia will fight in some wars, but not that many. And um, money was spent specifically um, just for the military. Economically, um, there would be new taxes, you know, included. But how would the economy grow? It's through uh, importing skilled workers from the West. That means from the Dutch, also Jews, and persecuted Huguenots from France. Okay, our last dude is going to be Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great. He uh, becomes king in 1740. A little bit of background about him. He is one of the best educated and culturally sophisticated monarchs of the 18th century. Okay, Best educated and culturally sophisticated. So it doesn't really sound very military, but actually he is. Right? Um, he's part of European and German history to make a lot of records and new discoveries and um, in contrast to his dad who didn't really care for any intellectual pursuits because of his love for culture and education his dad um, Frederick William the first was appalled by his uh, lack of manliness because of his curled hair and um, he knows how to play the flute um, but he also was very successful 
in his military campaigns and also his domestic reforms, uh, Prussia will become one of Europe's leading nations. Um, he is an enlightened despot and he will institute different reforms. Okay, so though he is enlightened, right, as a ruler, he still rules with absolute power. Um, he calls himself the first servant of the state, right, so um, he's ultimately serving his country and um, he, he really tries to change the concept of what a ruler is like, okay. Um, he invited Voltaire to live in his palace at Potsdam and uh, he supported scientific agriculture which was uh, introduced to him by Voltaire. He created a national code of law that was unified. He wanted to make it more efficient. He wanted to increase his power and uh, strengthening the institutions of bureaucracy. We talked about how um, char characteristics of um, absolutism um, and the modern state comes through bureaucracy. So he's strengthening bureaucracy, he's strengthening law and the military, and he wants to keep this in Prussia uh, as a focus even after his rule. And so he abolished also the use of torture, um, unless certain uh, exceptions, which was treason and murder. Um, he was a very able administrator. He carried on a lot of the wars that he was involved in without going into debt, unlike, yes, Louis XIV. Um, the Yunkers, they're back, they're around, they're here. The Yunkers and the Serfs, um, he, Frederick II, Frederick the Great, was a firm believer in social order. He knew that the philosophes did not um, condone uh, serfdom. And in fact, they, they condemned it. But uh, he realized, you know what, I do not want to rock the boat. I do not want to disrupt the social structure in Prussia. It's been going on for centuries and um, he basically strengthened the Junkers privileges even more, giving the Junkers completely full control over their serfs. Do what you want with them. That's your privilege. Okay. Um, he, he will provide religious toleration for Catholics and Jews and he uh, um, would appoint Protestants for major positions in government and military. Okay, so he has toleration, but he does show some favoritism, and uh, he encouraged Huguenots from France and Jews from Poland to immigrate to Prussia, and as we talked about, that would kind of uh, stimulate the economy as well. Um, so, some military campaigns. Frederick uh, II will move his forces into Silesia, which is in Bohemia. Okay, so who is in charge of Bohemia? Yes, the Austrians, the Habsburgs. And so um, there's two major wars. We have the War of Austrian Secession and the Seven Years' War that Frederick II is going to be involved in. What ends up happening is that he is successful. He acquires Silesia in 1740. And from that, his population that he is ruling over doubles. Okay, And his population doubles. His industries grow. And so Prussia as I say again, is going to become a great power. Um, we have a total of 6 million people now and 200,000 troops. And then there's a second Silesian War where more, territory, uh, more territories are gained and his reputation then becomes even greater as one of the tactical military, tactical geniuses and military commanders. Um, in the Seven Years' War, he successfully resists France, Russia, and Austria. And um, this is where he gets the uh, nickname Peter, uh, sorry, Peter, Frederick the Great. And uh, in 1772, uh, Prussia will participate in the partition of Poland and they will um, acquire Polish Prussia and also a portion of Great Poland. And we'll see how that all turns out in the map. Um, finally, he will call himself King of Prussia, no, no longer King in Prussia, and uh, he will acquire um, Royal Prussia, which is West Prussia in 1772 as well, and um, we're going to see um, him create the formation of Fürstenbund, uh, which is an alliance of Protestant princes in the Holy Roman Empire, um, and it was created 
yes, to go against the Habsburgs, and we'll, we'll get there. Um, Prussia is from Frederick the Great, known as a world power at this point. Here is an image of uh, Frederick the Great playing the flute inside his summer palace. His summer palace is um, created in Potsdam. It's called Sanssouci, S-A-N-S-S-O-U-C-I, Sanssouci. And uh, here we have a map of the growth of Prussia. So starting off from 1600, just Brandenburg, then they um, achieve the Duchy of Prussia. Um, so it's Brandenburg, Prussia, and then they gain more territories in the, gr the bright green. And then finally, from the partition of Poland, you gain all of those yellow territories. Here is an image of the attack of the Prussian infantry. And um, as you can see, right, um, they're in their ranks. Okay, they, they look really mad, really fierce and ready to fight. And uh, here's Frederick the Great on his white horse. Um, he is here leading the Prussian army in um, the Seven Years' War. All right, so we are done. That was faster than I thought. Um, hmm. Tomorrow's Thursday. Make sure you, uh, you know, study this. It's good to know. Don't get mixed up with all the Fredericks and Williams and ones and twos. Um, and get working on the resume. Remember, I want seven copies, okay? Seven copies. All right. See you guys tomorrow.